Let's consider the following example for a budget constraint. Suppose that we're concerned with the price of residential water, so the water that gets piped to people's homes. We're going to look at that as good one versus other things that the household might spend on. So in good two, we're going to group anything else. And for convenience, we'll set even the price to be one. So really, this, the good on the vertical axis will simply stand for money you have left to spend on other things. We also sometimes call it the composite good, but that's not important. In any case, we're going to focus on the pricing of water. And so that's the good we're putting on the horizontal axis. Water, as many utilities, is now typically priced in tiers, meaning that the price you pay per unit depends on the level of consumption. For example, suppose that there are two tiers in the pricing for water in, um, in a given city, so that if a household consumes up to 50 cubic meters, the price they pay for each is $2. If they consume above that, then any, exp any consumption above 50 will be priced at $4 per cubic meter, OK? As we said, we'll set the price of good 2 to 1 for convenience. And let's also consider M to be 300. M will therefore not be the household's full budget, most likely. But this will make it easier to see the graph. OK. So let's go ahead and draw the budget constraint. Might be easiest to draw it first as if this price applied everywhere, and then consider what happens when we increase price above a certain level. You may actually want to solve this on your own in your notes before playing the rest of the video. OK. So let's go ahead and get started. First, if we didn't consume any water, how much of other stuff would we be able to buy? Well, it would be 300 units. If the price was $2 throughout, then the budget constraint would look like this, where we would be able to buy at most 150 cubic meters. But of course, that's not what happens. Instead, the price remains at $2 only until we use 50 cubic meters, let's say here. which means that we've spent a third of our budget on water. So the slope here is 2. But any water we consume past that threshold is going to now cost us twice as much. So as we continue, we're going to be able to buy half as much extra water as we could when the price was 2. Okay, So this would have been 2. But instead, the tiered pricing will lead to a budget constraint that bends in. Okay, And we can calculate how much water can we then buy. Well, as you can see, if you've bought the first 50 cubic meters at $2, then you have $200 left with which you could buy at most 50 cubic meters in, a, in addition, so this will bring you to 100. Okay? So the tiered pricing budget constraint will have this shape. Of course, you could have more tiers. You could have a third tier, let's say, past 70 cubic meters. You could have the price be even higher, in which case this um, would have another kink here. It's worth asking why would water be priced this way? After all, we've seen another type of um, tiered pricing, right? We've seen the type where the firm may discount a good past a certain level, let's say past 10 units. They might set the price. Um, 
50% cheaper. So that'll be 50% off for X1 above 10. Okay. That was also a type of tier pricing, but it was different in that when you consume more, the price per unit becomes lower, whereas for water, when you consume more, the price per unit is higher. What accounts for the difference? Well, it's about the purpose of that um, differential pricing. For a commercial firm trying to sell merchandise, the goal is to get consumers to spend more on the good, right? <clears throat> whereas, um, and lowering the price will cause the consumer to switch towards consuming more of good one, the firm's good versus other goods. When it comes to water pricing, prices are um, regulated. So even if it is a private company that actually distributes water, their prices are not freely set. And the goal in how those utilities are priced is typically to reduce consumption. Okay? especially in areas that are prone to drought and with something like, like water. The goal is to reduce how much people consume. However, we don't want to make water unaffordable to households. An alternative would be right, to simply increase the price to $4 at all levels. That would mean that the budget constraint is much closer to the origin, you'd have potentially a problem with low-income households not being able to um, afford enough water. And so tiered pricing in that context has the advantage that it doesn't hurt low consumers, but it does discourage very high consumption. Whereas with discounts that apply above a certain level, the goal is the opposite. We want to encourage high consumption. Here's another example. Suppose you like to take extreme fitness classes at the Y, then you're facing two possible pricing structures. One would be you could take classes without being a member, in which case you pay more per class, or you could buy a membership and then pay less per class. In this example, suppose then that the non-membership uh, price is $20 per class, and then if you buy a $50 membership, you can buy each class or $10, okay? That is our good of interest, in this case a service, number of classes you take per month. And so on the other axis, we're going to put just anything else you spend money on. And so we're going to set that price to one just so we don't have to think about it. Suppose we have $180 to work with, then there are two distinct uh, budget constraints to show, right? Let's think about what they'll look like. First, if we don't have the membership, if the price is 20 and we have $180, then that means we could buy at most nine classes, right? So if we don't buy any classes, we can spend the full $180 on other things, which cost a dollar each. Or if we spend all of that money on classes, that would, that would allow us to buy nine of them. Okay. What about if we had the membership? How many classes would we be able to buy at most? You might be tempted to say 18. However, note that if we get the membership, we have to take that out of the full budget first. So if we were to buy the membership and then consider, for example, not buying any classes, we would be able to get at most 130 units of other things, okay? If we spend that full money left over on classes, we would be able to buy 13 of them. So now the slopes are 10 and 20, reflecting the two prices per class. But importantly, the budget constraint here intersects lower because now there's a fixed sum that we lose out of the budget every month, okay? And so you could see that depending on your preferences, one or the other option may be better for you. Let's consider another example. Suppose that you're trying to decide what 
data plan to purchase for your cell phone plan. And you have the following two options. You could buy a $20 one that gives you access to 10 gigabytes for free. And then above that, you have to pay $2 for every gigabyte you use. Or you could buy the $50 month plan, which includes 50 gigabytes free. And above that, you have to pay $1 per gigabyte. So the good of interest now will be the amount of data you use. measured in gigabytes. And on the vertical axis, we will again group other things. OK, so the composite good, meaning whatever is um, something we might want to buy, but that is not our main focus. OK, and for convenience, we let this have price one. Let's say that the budget we're working with is $100. Let's see how we could portray our options. Could we buy 100 units of good two? Well, we could. But in that case, we wouldn't have access to data at all, right? There's no option where you can buy data without any monthly charge. So to the extent that we want to portray that option, that's going to be a lonely point. Or we have the options of buying, let's say, the $20 a month plan. That means that we'll only have $80 left to spend otherwise on either data or other things. If we do that, then we will have access to 10 gigabytes for free. So as we start using data, the initial price will be zero. That means that the budget constraint will be flat over some portion until we get to a level of 10 gigabytes. After that, the price will be $2 a gigabyte. How much can we buy at most? Well, with $80 and $2 each, that means we could afford 40 gigabytes above 10 at most. So the budget constraint here has slope 2, and here has slope 0. What about the $50 a month plan? If we buy that one, then we'll only have $50 left cash. So that's the most we can spend on other things. However, now we have more data included for free. So as we consume more, we can get all the way up to 50 without being charged an addition. Let me mark this. Beyond this point, we again have to pay for our data use. How much can we buy at most? Well, with $50 and a dollar per gigabyte, we can buy another 50. So that means we will be able to consume at most 100 gigabytes of data. And the slope here is 1. So these two budget constraints are, are our option under the two plans. And this was the additional option of not buying a plan at all. Of course, which one turns out to be more useful depends on individual preferences.